and we are finishing our current sermon series, Believe, Belong, Become, The Day of the Lord is at Hand. All right, so I have a question for you this morning. I want you to get thinking, okay? You got to come to church. You can't just sit there. I'm going to make you work a little bit today, all right? So here's the question. When you hear the day of the Lord, what's the very first thing that comes into your mind? All right, so you got to think about that this morning. When you hear the day of the Lord or the day of the Lord is at hand, what is the very first thing that comes into your mind when you hear hear that? All right, so now how many of you, the very first thing that came into your mind was like the final day of judgment at the end of history? I mean, how many of you just went right there? I mean, you're thinking the book of Revelation. You're thinking God coming back and he's coming back with a flaming sword of fire. I mean, the sun and the moon and the hills are darkened. I mean, you just have that imagery going through your mind. How many of you, that was you right there, okay? All right, that's about what I figured. Now, did anybody think of immediately that it will also be a day of salvation, a day where there is a restoration of all things, the day where eternal life will begin and it will be upon us forever. Did anybody's mind go to that? That right there was anybody? Okay, those are my optimistic people right there. Most people in here are pessimistic. That's about what I thought, (laughs) where I figured. No, I, I, I figured that like When I think of the day of the Lord, my mind immediately goes towards like the day of judgment. I mean, I'm just thinking this sermon series, like believe, belong, become the day of the Lord is at hand. I mean, it sounds ominous, doesn't it? And it is on one hand, but it's also a day of of victory and hope. We saw both of that in our scripture reading that we had this morning. And here's what I want you to know right off the bat. When you think about the day of the Lord, you need to think about both. It is a day of judgment. But it's also a day of salvation. It's also a day that we as believers can look forward to. I brought a sword with me just to kind of help hopefully make this come to life a little bit. Okay, so there's two sides to this sword. There's two sides to the day of the Lord. All right, so imagine you all, I love all of you, okay, but you all are going to be the nations of the world that are wicked and gathered against God in the valley of decision. Okay, that's where we're going. So imagine Jesus coming back and he's got his fiery sword. And all of you are standing on this side of his sword. I mean, you are facing judgment. It's going to be a terrible day. It's a day that ought to make us sober. It's a day that ought to make us wake up and realize that there are people in this world. There are family members that we know that are lost. We have neighbors that are lost. We have people all around us that don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And on the day of the Lord, if they don't believe, they're going to run into the fiery judgment of God. And what an awful day that that's going to be. Now, you all over here, you all are my favorite. I like this side right here. You all listen to I'm just kidding. I love everybody. All right, but you all are are going to represent the believers, okay? When the day of the Lord comes, the Bible tells us that, that we're going to be coming with him together in the clouds. So imagine you're on this side of Jesus, and this sword now is working for your good. This sword is working for your salvation. This sword is working for the restoration of all things. This sword is working positive things on your behalf. And there's coming a day where God is going to judge, not just because he's a God that wants to destroy, because he's a God that is just and right. And he's going to restore all things to the way that he created them to be. And as a result of that, we are going to be ushered in to eternal life. Which side of the sword do you want to be on? Hey, I want this sword working on my behalf. I want this sword working for my good. The day of the Lord is both a day of judgment and it's also a day of salvation. We make the decision of whether or not we're going to believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We get to decide which side of that fiery sword that we want to be on. The title of my message this morning is Teach Me to Abide. Teach Me to Abide. We just got done singing that song. A song stood for inspiration for the message and where we're going to go this morning. But the day of the Lord, is it's a common theme throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament. You get into the prophets, you get into the minor prophets, the major prophets, you're going to hear a whole lot about the day of the Lord. You get into the New Testament. Jesus talked a lot about the day of the Lord in Matthew chapter 24 or 25, I think it is. We looked at some of that last week. I mean, some of the apostles, Peter talks about the day of the Lord. Paul talks about the day of the Lord. You have the entire book of Revelation at the end of the New Testament that's looking ahead and talking a lot about the day of the Lord. Why so much emphasis on the day of the Lord? What's it there for? Well, it's a call to repentance. If you don't know Jesus, He's telling us how it's all going to end. He's calling out to us in mercy and in love and in grace. Hey, repent, you can be saved. But for those of us who know the Lord as our Savior, 
It's a call to abide. It's a call to stay faithful. It's a call to stay alert. It's a call to walk in close communion with him. You know the title of this series, it's Believe, Belong, Become. You know what God wants us to do? The day of the Lord ought to motivate us to believe in Jesus and his transforming power. I love what Paul says. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. Uh, We don't just believe in Jesus at the moment that we get saved and then we get baptized and that's all there is to it. No, we get to believe in Jesus and his transforming power. Every step of the way that we go through life, it's always there and it's always available to us. You know what he wants us to do? He wants us to belong to his church. The church is the vehicle that he's using to show the world who he is. We have a mission. Hey, we got to tell the world, the day of the Lord is at hand. He's coming. But you can be saved, you can be spared, you can experience mercy, you can experience eternal life. That's our job. And you know what he wants us to do? He wants us to become everything that he created us to be. He's got big plans for you. He wants to use your life. I'm thankful for the D group emphasis today. And by the way, there's two things you can sign up for. Some of you just need to step up and be a leader. Some of you are ready to take your faith and you're ready to be stretched and challenged and to pass it on. So you can sign up to be a leader, but some of you just need to grow in your walk with Christ. You can sign up to be a part of a D group as well. And I want to encourage you to do that because God wants us to become everything that he wants us to be. So that what? So that the world around us, those lost family members that we're talking about, neighbors, coworkers, people that we love, friends, so that they'll believe in Jesus and his transforming power. So that they'll belong to his church. So that they'll become everything that he wants them to be. Are you thankful for what Jesus has done in your heart and in your life? Then we got to abide. We got to stay close. We got to stay faithful. We got to stay alert. We got to live on mission. And Joel chapter 3 gives us an awesome opportunity. It's a sobering passage. It's a hopeful passage. And it's a perfect opportunity for us to go before the Lord and say, Okay, Lord, teach me to abide. Teach me what you want me to see through this so that I can be everything that you created me to be. So let's just dive right in. We've got a lot to cover in a short amount of time. All right, so number one is this. If we're going to abide, we have to understand that God will judge. God will judge. Everybody look at verse one. It says, For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Can I tell you that verse one is a promise from God and it is a positive start to this chapter. You know what God's saying there? In those days, when I will bring again the captivity of Judah, when I will restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Do you understand that 4,000 years ago, God made a promise to a man named Abraham? And God came to Abraham and he said, hey, Abraham, guess what? I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to use you in a way where all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. I'm going to give you the land of Canaan to you and your descendants, and it's going to be yours forever. God made some pretty incredible promises. And guess what these promises were? They were an unconditional covenant. Those promises had absolutely nothing to do with Abraham and how he behaved. They had nothing to do with his children and how they had to behave. It had everything to do with God and his faithfulness. And he said, I'm going to make of you an everlasting covenant, and I will one day give you the land of Canaan. Your people are going to be great. Through you, all the nations of the world were going to be blessed. And guess what? God fully intends to fulfill that promise to the perfect letter and to the final T of everything that went into that promise. And guess what? If you open up your eyes and you look at the world stage and what's going on, There's a tiny little nation in the Middle East called Israel. I was thinking about this this morning. You know, just if we were alive just a hundred years ago and we got to a passage of scripture like this, we might be sitting there going like, he says he's going to restore them once again to their futures, but I don't know how this is going to happen. It's been 1800 years since they've been a nation. Do you understand (laughs) that God keeps his promises? If if you want to know that God's real, look at the nation of Israel. Just do a little bit of a a study and a deep dive there, and you will find that it is only exists because it's a miracle of God and his goodness and his faithfulness and his promises. And right before our very eyes, we can see proof that God and his word is absolutely 100% true. So he's going to restore again the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. That's a promise that this chapter begins with. And then in verse 2, he says this. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. God is going 
to judge. The word Jehoshaphat, it means Jehovah judges. Okay, so what God's going to do is, there's coming a day, he's going to gather all the nations of the world into the valley of Jehoshaphat, into the valley of judgment. And he's going to plead with them there on behalf of his people. You know what that word plead means? He's going to enter into legal proceedings. The scene is the scene of a courtroom. This is the final judgment of God, and he's gathering all the nations together to judge them. And can I tell you, the charges are serious. Look at the end of verse 2. He says, whom they have scattered among the nations and part at my land, and they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Just in those two verses, there's some very serious things that are coming against them. He's charging them with scattering his people among the nations. He's charging them for dividing up their land. He's charging them for cheating, treating his people like cheap merchandise and casting lots over them. He's charging them with human trafficking. Did you get the end of that verse? They sold their boys for harlots, and they sold their girls for alcohol. I mean, we're talking about wickedness that's been piled up, and, and God's going to judge the nations. In, five and, in verses 5 and 6, he adds more charges. He says, they've taken my silver and gold. They've plundered my land of its wealth and put it into their temples. They sold his people into slavery, okay? So these are the charges that he's going to level against all of these nations that are gathered together against him. And can I tell you, the nations are guilty. Look at verse 4. I love this verse. He says this, Yea, and what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coast of Palestine? Will you render me a recompense? And if you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? It's implied here, okay. It's implied here that the nations are going to come against God with their own charges against him. They're coming out. That's what he said. Are, are you going to plead with me? Are you going to accuse me of being unrighteous? Are you going to accuse me of being ungood? Are you going to accuse me of being unjust? Can I tell you right now that there is absolutely no justification whatsoever for the things that you have done? You are wicked. You are sinners. And you cannot justify yourselves. And by the way, the same thing is leveled against us. You might look at a list like this and say, yeah, I'm not, I'm not involved in stealing or plundering and doing different things like that. But we are guilty. And we are sinners. And when we stand before a holy God, there is no justification of our sins whatsoever. And that's what he's saying. You're going to plead with me. I'm going to plead with you there. And I'm going to return judgment. And it's going to be swiftly and speedily. And in verse 7 and 8, he basically says, I'm going to give you a taste of your own medicine. He's going to call the nation of Israel back from all the corners of the earth that they had been scattered to. And by the way, that has happened just even recently. In the past hundred years or so, that has happened. He's going to call them all back, and he's going to use them to punish the nations and to do the same thing to them that they did, to, to scatter their children throughout the earth. That's what God's going to do. He's going to pay them back speedily and quickly and essentially give them a taste of their own medicine. That's the first eight verses of the chapter. God will judge. Here's the practical application. Abide in justice. Abide in justice. Teach me to abide. God is just. He is the ultimate standard of what is right and what is wrong. Can I say that again? And you say amen, because it's something that we have to understand. God is just. Are you thankful for God's justice? He's the ultimate standard of right and wrong. Have you ever been to a point in your life where you've questioned God and some of his actions and the way that he works? If you're a human being that's been honest with God, there's probably been many times where you have said, God, how could you or why or what's happening or taking place? God is just. He is the ultimate standard of what is right and wrong. His justice means that he will punish sin and he will punish evil and he will do it righteously. God is a good God. He is right in all of his ways and in all of his dealings. And the way that it all comes to an end, whether you like it or not, it doesn't change the fact that God is good and God is right. And we cannot question God when it comes to these matters. His justice involves not only punishment, but it also involves restoring what was broken. His justice involves defending the weak and the oppressed and the mistreated. When God steps on the scene in justice, it is truly to right every single wrong that has been done and to restore things back to the way that he created it to be and the way that he intended it to be. And by the way, that's a day that we should all be looking for. I mean, we're in a political season right now. You ever get tired of watching TV and all those political ads that come on? 
It's just too much, right? And everybody's got their answer for what's going to solve our problems and bring peace and prosperity. No, God has the answers for what's going to solve our problems and bring peace and prosperity. I love that when we're talking about his justice in this passage, he makes it personal. I mean, in verses two and and three, I just, I circled everywhere the word my showed up. It's my people. It's my land. It's my heritage, Israel. It's my silver and gold. It's my goodly, pleasant things. I mean, all down through those first eight verses, God takes it very personally. What is happening and taking place in this world with his creation? There's coming a day where he's going to act on behalf of his people and his land. He's going to right all the wrongs. He's going to end all forms of injustice. He's going to establish his kingdom, and he's going to do it on behalf of his people. And by the way, if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, you know what Paul tells us in the New Testament? We just saw this in Romans, that we are grafted into the branch of Israel, that we are true Israel. And when God comes back, if you've put your faith and trust in him, if if you've made that decision to, to publicly follow Jesus and to make him your Lord and Savior, you're on his side. And that's going to be an awesome place to be. That's a comforting place to be. And he's going to act on behalf of his people, on behalf of you and me. And before I move on from this, I just want to mention this because it's so good. I came across this in several different spots as I was studying for this message. But God has a book and God has a bottle. I think both of these, when we're talking about God's justice, he has a book and he has a bottle. When you get to the end of the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 20, there is an incredible scene that is unfolding right there, the great white throne judgment. And he opens up the book, and if your name is not found written in the book of life, you are cast into the lake of fire with Satan and his angels for all of eternity. God is keeping records, and he has a book. By the way, if your name is found in the book of life, you get to pass into eternal life with Jesus Christ for all of eternity. He's keeping record. But you know what else God has? He has a bottle. Psalm 56, verse 8, tells us that God keeps count of all of our wonderings. He keeps count of all of our activities, and he puts our tears into a bottle. When I'm telling you to abide in God's justice, do you understand that God has seen every single step that you've taken, every single activity that's ever happened and taken place in your life? He's seen the tears that you've cried because you've experienced abuse or you've been mistreated or you've been marginalized. He sees the tears that you've cried over your sin and over your brokenness as you've been crying out to God, God, forgive me. I need help. I need another way. He sees every tear that you cry. He sees every pain that you've gone through and he's storing them up in a bottle because he keeps right record of it. And there's coming a day when he steps back onto the scene where he's going to act on behalf of all of that. God takes your life personally. He died for you on the cross. He is a good and loving God. Abide in his justice. God's going to judge. God will win. Are you thankful that God's going to win? Man, verses 9 through 11, I just see this. God, to me, God is heckling the nations here. He, he, he's, he's, he's taunting them. Look at verse 9. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. I mean, he's saying, hey, you want war with me? Let's get all your mighty men. Get them all out here. Gather them up. It's time for a fight. Then in verse 10, he says, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Now, in a modern context, It's almost as if God's looking from heaven and he looks at all the military weaponry, all the arsenal of nuclear weapons, and he's like, hey, that's not enough. Go get your your farm tools too. Get your hand on everything that you got and make them all into weapons. You you don't have enough. And then he's saying, and you know all those mighty men that are coming out to battle? That's not enough either. So go get your weak men and let them say, I am strong, and bring them out to battle too. Bring everybody. And then he says in verse 11, assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither calls thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. He's calling his people out. Now, I have a a very unspiritual story that I want to tell, and I'm going to bring it back to a very spiritual meeting, Lord willing. Okay. But I was thinking back to when I was in college, and I had this roommate, and he drove me crazy. Maybe he's turned into a good man today. I don't know, but he drove me crazy. He just was always just, I don't know, he's just kind of loud and talk, talked more than me and was louder than me, if you can even believe that, okay. So that's kind of what, he, and then he, he was always taunting, he's like, you know what, Brown, let's go, let's wrestle, I can take you down. And I was like, 
you can't take me down. I'm not even going to waste my time. And it went on like this all year long. So fine, sometimes I'd be like, fine, you, you, want, you want to fight? Let's go. Let's do it right now. And he's like, nah, last time I fought, I got rug burns. And I'm like, dude, rug burns? You can't talk like that in college, man. You can't call somebody out and then say you got rug burned last time you wrestled with somebody. That's just, that just proves I shouldn't even waste my time with you. But this goes on and on and on. And finally, it's like the second semester, we're late into the year, and he was just yapping, yapping, and I had enough. I mean, I'm only flesh, okay? I can only take so much. And I said, fine. That's it. We're going right now. I said, put sweatshirts on, put sweatpants on, whatever you got to do to cover your little rug burns up. We're going right now. We're going right now. Get out of the bed. We got like 10 minutes before we got to be the prayer group and get all spiritual, but we're going to take care of this. And so my roommates are like, oh, it's about time. This is good. You know, guys start coming down. It's going to be good. And I kid you not, we were like, we get down. They say go. 10 seconds later, I pick him up. I have him slammed on the ground and he's down there and he's like, oh, and I'm like, get up, you baby. You want some more? You know, I'm just like, I wasn't trying to be mean. It's just literally it was fun. Okay. It wasn't like it was animosity. I wasn't angry. I promise. But I was taunting him now, and he's like, no, no. I kid you not, he actually had to go to the hospital. He broke his collarbone. I did not intend to do that. I saw him like five years later, and I was like, how's that shoulder? He's like, I've had two surgeries. I was like, oh, my goodness. Don't wrestle in the dorm rooms, okay? I felt terrible, but I also felt kind of good, too. <laughs> not just kidding. Oh, my goodness. I told you a very unspiritual story. All right, so now get all that unspirituality. Why would I be thinking about that? When I thought of this passage, I, I almost thought of, honestly, that's how we've done to God. We heckle God. We taunt him. We even heard testimonies today about, like, like, I can do it on my own. I don't need God, right? We've been there before. And we just throw insult after insult. And you know what he keeps doing to us? He keeps blessing us with his goodness and with his mercy that's going to follow us all the days of our life. And we keep heckling God. And we keep taunting God. And yet we know that we're no match for God. We don't want nothing to do with it. But one day, he's going to say, everybody, you're going to gather to the valley of decision. You're going to gather to the valley of judgment. And the decision has already been made. It's already final. His mind has been made up. And the verdict is going to be passed and it's going to be guilty. God will win. And can I tell you when he wins, he's going to roar. Look at verse 13. He says, put you in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come get you down for the press is full. The fats overflow for their wickedness is great. That book and that bottle that we talked about, I mean, that, that record that he's keeping, it is filled up. The Bible says that God is long suffering and I'm thankful that he's long suffering. Sometimes we're like, why don't you come sooner? What if he came sooner in your life? What if his mercy ran a little bit shorter than, than what we need? I'm thankful that God's long-suffering because he's giving people a space and a chance to repent. But there's coming a day where all of that's going to be filled up. And, and the harvest of sin and wickedness is going to be ripe. And it says, multitudes, multitudes, verse 14, in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And it's not like people are coming to the valley of decision saying, oh, maybe I should choose God. No, the decision is the judge has passed a verdict. It's sentencing day. You're guilty. And this is your punishment. And then it says in verse 15, the sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining the Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. Just let the truth of God's word just sink into your heart for a minute. The Lord's going to roar out of Zion. And what a powerful day that's going to be. And then I love how it ends. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. The Lord is going to roar and the Lord is going to win. And can I tell you this morning, you know what we need to abide in? We need to abide in fear. We need to abide in fear. I, I, when I think of the fear of the Lord, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I always think of this simple outline when I think of the fear of the Lord. I think of fear, fear not, and fear. Okay, so fear. You know what we need? There needs to be a literal terror and dread and all of God and his holiness. Listen, if you and I were to stand before God and meet God in our sin, meet God without the righteousness of Jesus Christ, there ought to be a literal fear. 
When you think about the day of the Lord, if you think about standing before God and you don't know him as your Lord and Savior and you don't have the confidence that you have a relationship with him, you ought to fear that day, literally fear that day. No man can stand before God and live. The Bible tells us that. And every example of a human being throughout the Bible that was in the presence of God, the first thing they did was they hit their face in fear and terror and dread. God is nobody to be trifled with. But you know what? Not only is he the lion that's going to roar one day, he's also the lamb that was slain. Revelation chapter 5 gives us this unbelievably beautiful picture John's been ushered into heaven. He's having a vision, and there's this book. And you know what the book is? The book is the day of the Lord. It, the day of the Lord's not just one day. It's a series of events all at the end, how it's all going to unfold. And to get to eternal life and to get to righteousness, somebody had to open the book and, and unveil all the details that had to unfurl. And there's a great search that's made all throughout heaven and earth, and nobody was found worthy to open the book. And John hits the floor, and he's weeping. He's like, there's no one worthy. There's no hope for us. And an angel comes up and taps John on the shoulder and he says, fear not, for behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he hath prevailed. He can open the book. I mean, wow, right there, that's just awesome. So John looks up and he looks in the direction that the angel's pointing. And I think he's probably fully expecting to see this lion that roars, but he looks and you know what he sees? A lamb as it had been slain. He saw Jesus And you know, every time we're faced with the fear and terror and dread of God, we can find Jesus and he sent his son who was the lamb that was slain. Jesus paid for our sins. We are guilty, but Jesus said, I'm gonna take your punishment. I'll pay, I'll give my life. All you have to do is believe on me and you can be saved and you can have eternal life. Fear not, God wants a relationship with you. That's the greatest news in all the world. But you know what? I'm still saying abide in fear. Because the Bible tells us, even in the New Testament, to work out your salvation in fear. What is that fear? To me, the fear is missing out on everything that Jesus wants to do in your life. Missing out on his transforming power. Missing out on becoming everything that he created you to be. That song that we just got done singing. You're the way, the truth, and the life. You're the fountain that never runs dry. I I love it. Be my all, my treasure, my prize. Teach me, Lord, to abide. That's what it's all about. Man, when you find passages like this and you run into the truth of who God is, abide in fear and get on your face before the Lamb of God and say, thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you for your salvation. And I want to live for you. I don't want to miss out on what you're trying to teach me and show me through your example. Oh, help me to abide. Man, fear missing out on all that he's done for you and all that he wants to give you now and in eternity. And last but not least, and we're done, God will bless. God will judge. God will win. God will bless. To the believer, oh boy, those are encouraging words. Verse 18, I'm not going to read it. It tells us that he's going to bless the land. And verse 18, you you get done reading a verse like verse 18, and you just think, man, there's a promised land that is coming. There's the Garden of Eden. Like, it's going to be a wonderful land. God's going to bless the land. Verse 19 tells us that he's going to punish the wicked. You know what's awesome about eternal life? There's no enemies of God. There's no wickedness. There's nobody to torment you any longer. There's only perfectness. The enemies of God will be fully punished and be fully judged and taken care of. And then verses 20 and 21, he's going to bless his people. Look what it says. But Judah shall dwell forever and Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. And that's just another reminder that God's going to judge He's going to come in justice. He's going to avenge the bloodshed that he's not yet avenged, and his people will abide forever. His people will abide forever. What an awesome day that's going to be. And here's the last application. Abide in hope. Abide in hope. We saw that word hope at the end of verse 16. It said, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. You know the word for hope in Hebrew, it's tikvah. It means expectation. It means confidence in the future. That's what hope is. Hope is an expectation. It is a confidence in the future. Are you confident in the future? Oh boy, that was not very convincing. (laughs) Are you confident in the future? I mean, based on what we just read about, if you're his child, it's going to be a day of blessing. We don't have to face his judgment. There's an expectation there. There's a hope. You know what else that word hope means? It also, in Hebrew, it it means quarter rope. 
it has this idea. I brought a rope with me. Let's just see if I can get this out. It has the idea of a rope. Oh, man, I didn't get it untangled. We'll see how this goes. I want to kind of pull it around. But anyway, a rope has several different cords. It has several different strands, and they're all bound together. Like if you come up here, you'll see a bunch of things twisted. Then if you look close, you see all these other different strands that are in here. The expectation and the hope that God's people have is based on the truth of his word and the reality of things that are piled up and stacked up in store for us. Okay, so the idea of hope, hope is a rope. And I love what Jeremiah 29, 11 says. Go ahead and put that up on the screen. Y'all help me read Jeremiah 29, 11, okay? Let's read this out loud together. What's it say? For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. That word expected is tikva. It's, it's hope to give you a hopeful end. You know what God's doing? He's writing to his people, Israel, and, and they're in Babylonian captivity because of their unfaithfulness. But God's faithful. And he's saying, I know you're wondering if you're ever going to get back into your land. And I know you're wondering if I'm ever going to be good. But I want you to know this. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. And they're thoughts of good. They're not evil thoughts. And they're to bring you to a hopeful end, to an expected end. God's got a hopeful future for us. Hope is a rope. Do you understand that this rope here, man, it is attached and tied to Jesus? I'm just going to put it up here. It's probably not going to stay. You get the point, okay? I take it to the baptistry. What's the baptistry? It's a picture of the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those people that just got saved today, they publicly professed their faith and belief in the fact that Jesus died to pay for their sins, that he was buried because that was the punishment for sin and he was literally buried. But then he rose again because he's more powerful than sin and he's more powerful than death and he's more powerful than hell and he's more powerful than the grave. And he rose again and he's alive today. And if he rose again, we can rise again and we can live with him for all of eternity. And you know what our hope is based in? Not just some fake frivolous words, not just some hope so belief. It's tied to Jesus Christ. And he wants us to abide in hope. You know what you can do? You can wrap yourself around the blood of Jesus Christ. You can tie yourself in. You can do whatever you need to. Strap yourself a harness. It doesn't matter what's ahead in your future. It doesn't matter what kind of problems and turmoil you're going to face in this life. If you are tied to Jesus, you are tied to the rope of hope. And there is an expected end that is coming. And it's a good end. And it's a wonderful end. And it's an end that's filled with blessings and promises and the righteousness of Jesus for all of eternity. So why are we fearful? Why are we scared of the election that's coming up? Why are we worried about the problems that we're going to have to face at work tomorrow? We know how this is all going to come to an end. We got Jesus Christ. He says, cast all your cares upon me. I care for you. He says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Are you attached to the rope of hope? Are you abiding in his faithfulness and his goodness? He's the fountain that never runs dry. I don't know what your problems are today. I don't know what your struggles are. I don't know what you're going through. But I know that Jesus does. I know that he's taking your tears and he's storing them up in a bottle. I know that he loves you. I know that he went to a cross to save you. I know that he knows how this is all going to end. And one day he's going to come back with that fiery sword and he's going to work it all out. And it's going to be for our good because he's a good God. Man, are you thankful for the day of the Lord? Are you thankful for the truths and the hope that we have in God and in who he is and in Jesus Christ and what he's done for us? Are you abiding in hope? Man, get a hold of Jesus. Get a hold of the amazing promises in his word. I saw a message this week. It was really good. It was this one guy, the pastor. He's like, brought a stack. He's like, I found 10 promises in God's word. He's like, I could read them all to you, but that wouldn't be enough. And he's like, I got 30 promises here. I got 50 promises here. He took a stack of 500 and just threw the pages out. Come read them for yourself. That book is filled with promises from Jesus Christ to his people. And if he says it, he's going to do it because he's a faithful God. And it's not based on how we act or how we respond to him. It's based on his faithfulness. And even though we're sinners, if we just get on our knees and humbly go before God and say, God, I got issues. I got problems. By the way, this is my prayers every day of my life. I want to be everything that you want me to be. 
I want your light to shine through me. I need your help. I need your strength. And I, I grab a hold to that rope. I grab a hold to some of those promises and those strands. And I secure myself in Jesus. And I can go out and I can live in hope. And I can live in that fear of not missing out on those blessings that he wants to pour out of my life daily. And I can live confidently because he's just and he's right. He's going to take care of it all in his way and in his time. That's who our God is.